Well, good morning, good people. Mark Holmes here, of course, with my buddy Cowboy Joe Boo, as well as Joe Bear in the house. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. So let's get open for business here and let's wake up the football gods. Hope everybody's doing great on this Taco Tuesday. It's Taco Tuesday and I hope all your taco dreams come true. And it is also NFL trade deadline which had been put back after 2012. The NFL pushed it back till after week number eight of the NFL season. And since that time, we've seen a few more trades actually happen. It used to be the trade deadline was kind of, oh, okay, the trade deadline passed. But now, of course, the NFL can sell anything. The speculation of who's going to get traded and, and ideas that might fit and this, that, and the other, that people go crazy for all of it. And it's deservingly so. We are NFL whores, okay? We just love hearing about anything. We like to dream and fantasize about, you know, getting this player and that player and, you know, getting into the playoffs and making that run and ultimately, hopefully, holding up that Super Bowl trophy. And so that's where it seems like lately, because we've seen teams that load up in the middle of the season, they end up going on a run and getting it done. So this is about selling hopes and dreams and all of that. Now, we sit here about six and a half hours left, six and a half hours left. And I'll remind you that <clears throat> for the Dallas Cowboys, we were told that we were ass. You remember that? Remember when we lost Lyle Collins? We lost Connor Williams. Oh my God, the Cowboys offensive line is going to be crap. Oh, they need to resign. Oh, they they lost. That offensive line is going to be in shambles. It's going to be awful. What are they doing? The Cowboys, they need to hire a GM. Jerry Jones and Stephen Jones, the mom and pop shop. They are awful. Oh my God, they did an El Paso on Randy Gregory. How do you let a guy like Randy Gregory go? Are you kidding me? And then you redid Demarcus Lawrence deal? Oh my God, no. The Cowboys, they're a mess. They are a mess. Cedric Wilson goes to Miami. Oh, they're going to be in trouble. Their offensive line stinks. Their quarterback is average. They have no receivers. They are terrible. There's 15 teams better than the Dallas Cowboys, I believe uh, uh, Colin Cowherd said. I believe after the first week of the season, when they were doing the NFL tiers, they said it were just tiers for the Cowboys, as far as the power rankings, that they had no chance in hell after Dak Prescott went down. But here we are. We'll find out what the power rankings have today. Are the Cowboys the top five team? The funny thing is, the Cowboys blow out the Chicago Bears. After some of these guys were predicting that upset alert, Bears aren't the old Bears. They went to New England. They scored a lot of points on Bill Belichick. They, they're running the ball 200 yards a game. These are not the bad news Bears. They're a good team. And they just had a big victory. They're going to turn things around. You know, they're going to be playing the Cowboys, which is like the Super Bowl. Cowboys win. It's just the Bears. It's just the Bears. Just like the week before where we shut out, basically, you know, the, one of the highest scoring offenses in football, and the Lions. They only, we only gave up six points. No, it's just the Lions. The Lions, you mean that, you know, scored boatloads of points and almost upset Miami in Miami? I didn't hear anybody say it was just the Lions. I, I don't remember anybody saying yesterday it was just the Lions when Miami won. Oh, my God, Tua. Tua's doing incredible things. That team, it's great. It's great. We beat the Lions. It's just the Lions. 
But that's okay. Because in the end, what those guys say really don't matter because they don't get anything right more than we do. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Right now, the Eagles, they do have the best record in football. But that's subject to change. It's possible. It may be that they go undefeated and win the Super Bowl. But the reality is nobody, and I mean nobody, knows. But what I can say about this Dallas Cowboys team is they have faced more adversity than probably anybody else and have gotten up off the mat. You don't lose an all-pro left tackle two weeks before the season starts and take a rookie who's been playing guard and plug him in and not have problems. You don't lose your team's NFL season season touchdown passer with 37 the year before after the first game for five games and not have adversity. You just don't. We've seen that happen before when Tony Romo goes down. Every time Tony Romo's gone down, so is the season. You lose your starting running back. Next guy up thrives. The Cowboys have faced more adversity from the coach being on the hot seat where they literally had the next guy on speed dial to being here as one of the better teams in football. And here's what I'm gonna say. I wanna play something that, you know, one of, one of the best things that I ever got to do. But I want you to listen to this interview and understand how the Dallas Cowboys were built. Unfortunately, it, it, it's almost tragic that the Cowboys had the perfect partnership and Jerry's ego got in the way. I don't know that Jimmy Johnson wins all those Super Bowls without Jerry. And I don't think, well, we've seen Jerry doesn't win all those Super Bowls without Jimmy. And it's sad that it ended up after only two of those Super Bowls, it broke up. But listen to how the Cowboys were built. Okay, listen to it. You're up and then James Harris. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, let me first say congratulations on getting into the Hall of Fame. Uh, watching that live on television, that raw emotion was just beautiful. Um, I have so many questions for you. I think about the only way I could get them in is to get a cooler beer and head out on, <laughs> and go fishing with you. <laughs> but um, leaving the University of Miami and coming to the Dallas Cowboys, and at that time they were basically broke, busted, and thoroughly disgusting to watch. Having gone from the pinnacle down to the depths, what was that like? And the second part of this question would be, I uh, played football at JMU with Charles Haley and knowing the character that he is and all the personalities that you had with the Cowboys, how were you able to mold them and keep them focused on the grand prize, which was winning? Well, you know, first of all, you know, you know, people look back on it and, and they say it was an easy decision to leave the University of Miami. You know, but, you know, we had gone through four straight seasons where we played a national schedule and been on national television every other week and only lost two regular season games. And so we had a powerhouse football team. And I knew it was going to continue that way because we had a great you know group of talent. And then going to Dallas, you know, Tom Landry is one of the greatest coaches of all time. Mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, they had had three straight losing seasons there at the bottom of the NFL at three and 13 because they just didn't have any talent. And, you just know, obviously there were some older players that uh, helped us, uh, you know, in winning our Super Bowls. But a lot of it had to do with, you know, I, I brought in Tony Wise, my offensive line coach, and he he put together what is considered one of the greatest offensive lines in, in NFL history. But he did it with a, a free agent defensive tackle, Mark Tuane, at left tackle. He did it with a left guard where the previous staff said get rid of him because he was too fat, Nate Newton. <laughs> we took a, a third-round pick, a 245-pound offensive guard. I asked Tony, I said, can you convert him to a center? He said, I'll make him into a center. So we moved Stepnowski to center. And then we took a seventh-round pick, 
Kevin Golgan, uh, who had struggled his early years, we moved him to guard and took a third round pick, Eric Williams at right tackle. So, you know, those players hadn't developed, but Tony Wise was able to develop them into a great offensive line. And so, you know, the combination of having some great assistant coaches and acquiring a lot of talent with 51 trades in five years, we were able to win that Super Bowl. So it was a great feeling. Thank you very much for that. I'll follow up you about Charles Haley. Yes. He's a character. <laughs> he's he is a character. character but he is one of my favorites. Uh, uh, you know, Charles and I developed a great relationship after a few uh, rocky roads uh, there early in his career at Dallas. Uh, we had a couple of run-ins, but we, we really got together. You know, really, he came into my office after I had berated him a, a couple of times at, at one of the ball games. And he said, Coach, he said, if you will just get on to me one-on-one -on -one in your office, he said, I'll do anything in the world for you. I, I love playing for you. He said, but just don't embarrass me in front of the other players. And I said, you know, Charles, I, I may not always be able to do that, but I'll try. But from that time forward, we had a great relationship. And he was a big part of us winning Super Bowls. Thank you very much. And how about them Cowboys? <laughs> I should have trademarked that. <laughs> yeah, he should have definitely he should have definitely trademarked that. That's the reason I play that is is to see how the Cowboys were built. The Cowboys, when you look at how they're currently constructed right now, um, the Cowboys have found talent in places that other teams have not been able to. Um, you hear Jimmy Johnson talking about, you know, Nate Newton, who the Washington Commanders, formerly the Washington Redskins, they said, he's too fat. We got rid of him. He's a bum. We make him one of the best offensive linemen that we have. To me, he should be at least in the ring of honor. Um, you ended up taking Mark Stignowski, who was a, you know, 240 pound guard and making him a center. You know, you ended up taking Gogan, who was a seventh round pick and, you know, ends up being great. And Eric Williams, who I think was a third round pick. These guys weren't all high pedigree players, but they did their work to find the right guys to go and build a team. And you look at this right now, you know, the Cowboys, we got Biotis, who, um, the first two years left, excuse me, left a lot uh, to the imagination, who quietly is doing really good things. We, we don't give him credit right now, but right now, you know, I believe against the Lions, he was the high, second highest graded offensive lineman. We have Terrence Steele. Terrence Steele, our starting right tackle, who was an undrafted free agent. Yeah, of course, we got Tyler Smith, who had the pedigree, the number one pick and all that. But we have guys that are all over the place. And that's what the Cowboys did during the 90s. They brought in a lot of people. They got the draft picks and stuff. They drafted. And not every one of the players that they brought in worked. But they were constantly bringing in pieces here and there. And the Cowboys have gotten back to a lot of that. The one thing that the Cowboys haven't gotten back to is that big, bold move. You can look at Charles Haley. The move was the power shift from San Francisco to the Dallas Cowboys. It hurt San Francisco losing him, although he was crazy, crazy Charles, and you know not getting along with teammates. And they looked and said, "We got, it's either it's either Steve Young or Charles Haley, and quarterbacks are hard to find. We got to get rid of Charles Haley." But that quiet storm, no, it wasn't quiet. Actually, Charles was very vocal. That storm that went to Dallas helped propel them. It helped to take a team that was good to the next level. Deion Sanders, same thing, boom, became that bold move that kept him on top. That is what is missing now with the Cowboys. And it seems like Jerry Jones is realizing that with this team that is very young. Mind you, I want you to understand this. When you look at Tampa Bay, and I told you guys, Tampa Bay is getting up there in age. And then you add to that Tom Brady's you know, mess that he's got, boom, that team kind of imploded. The Cowboys, going into the season, were the third youngest team in the NFL. This is like the 90s. They're learning how to win. They're beginning to grow together. 
You just need that extra piece to take you over the top. And it drove me crazy last night watching the Cleveland Browns uh, versus the Bengals, watching Amari Cooper with his 131 yards on five catches and thinking, we had that guy here. And now here we are at the trade deadline with six hours and 10 minutes left. We're talking about trying to get somebody. Will the Cowboys and Jerry Jones be bold and say, we're going to go ahead and go in? I don't know. Let's listen to uh, Get Up This Morning, their take on it. Seven and a half hours away from the NFL trade deadline. Who will make the one move today that changes absolutely everything? Will it be the Cowboys? We're going to Dallas where the boys are in an unexpected arms race in the best division in football yesterday, Stephen Jones was asked about his willingness to act aggressively before the trade deadline. Here's what he said. At the right situations there, uh, we're always looking uh, to make our team better. And obviously, we're very much in the uh, thick uh, of a championship run this year. So uh, absolutely, if we see the, uh, the right situation that presents itself, uh, you, you know Jerry as well, who has the final call on this. Uh, he's an aggressive guy. I sounded like Stephen from the plane. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the plane. Uh, but one way or another, uh, you know, he said the same thing they all say. Well, if the right situation presents itself. But then he's a Jones, so he's got to throw in. But we're making a championship run this year, oh, yeah. which at least makes it a little bit of fun. Okay, let's start with the Cowboys. They made a move last week. Should we expect anything more from them today? I mean, uh, look, I, I think they're they're looking around, but... The, the Cowboys think they're good, and, and, and I think they're right. Uh, so if you make a move, it has to upgrade you. Uh, like, if you think, mm -hmm. we're going to go get a wide receiver, but we also have James Washington coming back, who we liked in the offseason. Mm -hmm. like, like, if you're going to trade for somebody who's, who's a lot better than James Washington, fair. That, that's fine. But I don't know that they're, that they're going to just go out there to make it. They did make a move last week. Get the D tackle, Jonathan Hankins. That fills a need. He okay. played well yep. uh, on Sunday. So... I think they, they'd be open to upgrades, but I think it has to be an upgrade. So if someone like me were to say <laughs> the Cowboys, as constituted, based in particular on what we saw from that offense on Sunday against Chicago, look like a Super Bowl team yep. right now, what would someone like you say? Oh, I'd say 100%. You're correct. They do look like a Super Bowl contender. Mm -hmm. They figured it out at the running back position, uh, running the ball through those two guys, not putting too much on Dak. 12 and 13 guys. personnel. He can be a game manager for like half of their games for the rest of the season, and they're going to win them. They scored 42 points on offense in this yeah. past game, mm -hmm. 49 total because obviously Michael Parsons, Parsons had the return for a touchdown, but that's a lot of points for a Cowboys team that had only scored 41 in the previous two combined. Mm -hmm. So I think they have figured it out. I'm actually extremely uh, proud of Mike McCarthy and Kellen Moore because these two guys have wanted to throw the football Every stop they've ever been, obviously Kellen's only been in Dallas, right. but back in college he was a toss it around all over yeah. the field type of guy, and he brought that mentality to the boys. I'm glad that they learned that the best thing for their team this year is to run the football. And let's circle back to something that we said before the break, and we heard it yesterday, and you see the numbers at the bottom of your screen, Pollard and Elliott. A lot of calls for Tony Pollard after the explosive day on Sunday to become the lead back. Make him your starter. You like that idea? Absolutely not. That's why you can't <laughs> have nice things in Dallas, because you always want to screw stuff up. Thank God Jerry is a voice of reason, and we know he always is, because he told the people what they needed to hear. This thing goes through Ezekiel Elliott. I am not saying that Pollard isn't more explosive than Ezekiel Elliott. I'm not saying he's not a good running back. He deserves to be paid all of those things. But you do not disrupt your locker room when things are going this well. And by the way, Elliott will be a ground and pound type back. He will make plays for you. Mm -hmm. And it does go through Elliott and then Pollard is the other guy. I heard, I talked to Swagoo yesterday on this. Just saying, he's telling me to put Pollard. No, 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 no. Let Pollard be what he is, an explosive running back when he gets his touches. But you're going to have to have both anyway. Don't mess it up. Thank goodness for Jerry Jones. RG3. It's, it's a fascinating way of putting that. <laughs> RG3, how many touches a game should Tony Pollard be getting? Oh, I think he should be getting 20 touches a game. But my man Jeff Saturday said it exactly right. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. 
Right now, Zeke is the guy that takes the brunt of all the issues, right? He's, you know, averaging four yards a carry or something like that. But Pollard in the game, I can go through and tell you how many carries he's had throughout the season, but that doesn't matter. What matters is in this last game, 14 carries, that's the most in his career. Mm -hmm. 14 carries. Don't try to load him up and give him the ball 20, 25 mm -hmm. times right. and be upset when he's not the same guy down right. the stretch in the playoff. That's the point. That, that's that, exactly that right. is the thing. And I'm not saying he can't handle it. I'm yeah. saying this year for what the Cowboys are doing. For the doing, betterment of the team. The betterment of the team. Do not I mean, change the recipe. It has just the right season. Yes. He's been on their mm. team for four years. Yeah. Like they know who he is and they know how to get the most out of him. Right. 14 carries mm -hmm. is a real nice number for him. Yes. He yes. can thrive at that number. If you start getting it to 20, 25, you don't know what, what's going to happen. You're going to kill him. So it, it's working with the two of them. I would go right back to And him. let me ask one more question about them before we get to the pancakes. How about Dak? The only questions, what did good. you see from him on Sunday? He's <laughs> three weeks ahead of schedule. And I, I mean mm -hmm. that in all sincerity. Like, I did not expect, and you, you talked about the points and the differential, all those things. He threw two off-target throws out of 27. He just had his thumb in pins in a cast. Right. Came off one week where he was a little sluggish and then lit it up against the Bears. Saw the field well, and everybody's giving Kellen Moore a ton of credit. Great, he should. When you throw 25 of 27 balls on target in the NFL, you are doing something. Dak Prescott is Ooh. way ahead of where I expected him. And again, <clears throat> part of the reason why you're saying this is going to be a Super Bowl contender is because when he gets back into the, in the rhythm, he gets back this fast, ooh, this is, a, this is a team that will push and push everybody. Second best team in the NFC right now. Behind Philadelphia. Behind Philadelphia. And could keep, keep going this way, could be pushing that thing as well. We'll see. They, they, oh. Philly still has to come to Dallas later in the season. It's yep. actually the only game our analytics don't favor the Eagles to win. So Ooh. it's going to be fascinating. Ooh. Suddenly the NFC East is clearly the best division in the NFL. Okay. All right. The best division in football where there is nobody with a losing record. Nobody with a losing record. And I'm looking at NFL.com's power ranking that just came out. They have the Cowboys right now at four, the Eagles at two, the Giants drop out of the top 10, drop to 11. And actually, wait, where's, where's, I forgot, where's the Commanders? Are the Commanders? Hmm. I guess the Commanders are still below 20. Let's see, Cardinals, Raiders, Bears. Oh, well, they moved Washington to 25, which is kind of, are you telling me that the Raiders are better than the Commanders? Really? I think Washington is actually getting a little disrespect here at four and four, that they literally say the Bears are better than them, that the Raiders that are two and five are better than them. The Cardinals... The Browns, I'll say the Browns are better. That Tampa Bay is better right now? I don't think they are. That the Packers are better. Okay, all right, well, Washington gets disrespected. Not my fight. But as always, I appreciate each and every one of you guys. We got all kinds of stuff that we're gonna be working on today. I'm gonna be doing a video talking about <laughs> 12 personnel because I love 12. And now we got 13 personnel. Yeah, we got that going on. And Micah Parsons who is not getting any kind of calls whatsoever. So as always, friends, I want to thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. And you know you'll see me later. Our folks here, and as always, I want to thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. And the only thing else I got to